Our speaker this, this afternoon has come to us at some great distance, as you know. He is an award-winning BBC broadcaster for more than 20 years, uh, presenting Panorama on BBC One and The Money Program on BBC Two. Lord Alan Watson is currently the chairman of CTN Communications. Uh, based at their TV studio complex in St. Martin's Lane, London, CTN is acknowledged as a preeminent multimedia consultancy and production company. He's a fellow of the Royal Television Society and a former chairman. He was head of media at the European Commission for five years and European chairman of Burson Marsteller for more than 10 years. Lord Watson holds many visiting and honorary posts and doctorates at universities in Britain and abroad and was recently awarded an honorary doctorate by Birmingham University, where he chairs the advisory board of the Jubilee Center for Character and Values. He was elected as high steward of Cambridge University for life in 2010 and is a patron of the Churchill Archives at Churchill College. Lord Watson is a committed internationalist and serves as president of the British German Association, chairman of the Franco-British Society, vice president of the English Speaking Union, and for six years chairman of the Council of Commonwealth Societies. He is remarkably accomplished, and we're thrilled to have him here today. He has in his collection of books, Jamestown, The Voyage of English, The Queen and the USA, and of course, the topic of today's talk, Churchill's Legacy, Two Speeches to Save the World. Lord Watson was appointed commander of the British Empire in 1985, and in 1999, he became Baron Watson of Richmond. Please join me in welcoming Lord Watson. Well, good day, everybody. It's very splendid to be here. Um, as you were just told just now, uh, my full title is Lord Watson of Richmond. And uh, <coughs> of course, that's Richmond on Thames, not Richmond on the James. But uh, there is a very close relationship between the two cities, and of course, a very close relationship between the two rivers. And uh, indeed, later on today, the Duke of Gloucester is going to be presenting uh, to a very worthy recipient what is called the Richmond's, not apostrophe S, but just plural, the Richmond's Medal. And the medal, which was designed by a very famous sculptor in, uh, in Richmond, in, in England. And on one side, it depicts the Thames, uh, as seen from Richmond Hill. And on the other side, it depicts the James River, as seen from Pebble Hill. And uh, we try to award these medals once a year, just usually one on the American side and one on the British side. So it's a very close and warm relationship. And uh, without going on about it, I do think that you know we talk a lot about Anglo-American relations. We talk a lot about the relations between governments. And uh, when you have the president you do, that can be quite a challenge. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I gather he's still determined to have tea with the Queen, so we await that one with great interest. But um, <laughs> it's, uh, at the end of the day, it's not about relations between governments, really. It's, uh, it's a relationship between peoples and communities and values and experience and a view and a vision of the world. And that's really the bonding that really does exist, I think, between America and Britain. And of course, the royal marriage, which I'm sure a lot of you saw, <laughs> will certainly help. <laughs> so, Finally, we've got an American in the royal family. So, <laughs> <coughs> Now, my subject today is uh, these two extraordinary speeches which Churchill made in 1946. And uh, just before I start explaining the background to it, I must just share with you one experience. Uh, I have lectured on this theme in Fulton, Missouri, which is, of course, one of the locations of one of the two famous speeches, the other being Zurich, Switzerland. And uh, I was doing this in the church there, which was the extraordinary church. Uh, it, it was a bombed out church in, uh, in London, near St. Paul's. And Fulton, as a memorial to Winston Churchill, bought the ruins of the church from the Bishop of London, 
and shipped it across the Atlantic and rebuilt it at Fulton. <laughs> Marvelous, isn't it? I, just fantastic. Anyway, there I was, and I was meant to be talking, and there were quite a lot of uh, school children there, you see, and one small boy suddenly put up his hand, he said, wave, 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 very determined. And my experience with small boys waving their hands in a very determined fashion is you better respond. <laughs> it's no good waiting. So I went to the young man and I said, yes, you know, can I help you? And he said, um, well, he said, I've got a question. He said, uh, you know, if you were born when you say you were born, <laughs> you're over 100. So why haven't you croaked? <laughs> Marvellous. I explained that I wasn't Winston Churchill. And, uh, <laughs> yes. Anyway, it was a good occasion. Um, well, now to these two speeches and what gave birth to these two speeches. I'll talk about the consequences of the speeches as I go through and also in my concluding remarks. But um, I think the origin is very important. The origins of these two speeches really lie at the Potsdam Conference, which concluded the Second World War in Europe. And of course, as many of you will know, perhaps all of you know, uh, Churchill arrived at Potsdam as British Prime Minister, had to leave in the middle, to go and fight a general election in Britain, which he lost, and his place was taken by Mr. Attlee, who then became Prime Minister. Uh, there's a very funny story told about Churchill trying to explain that he was going to have to go back to Britain to fight an election to Mr. Stalin, <laughs> who found it somewhat incomprehensible, <laughs> and simply said, do not worry. I have never lost an election. <laughs> anyway, Churchill, I think, knew pretty well that he was going to lose, and indeed did. So that's very important in terms of these two speeches, because Churchill loses the election. And as many of you will know, Churchill suffered from sometimes a form of depression, which he always called his black dog mood. And if the dog took him by the throat, uh, the mood could last quite a long time and could be serious in terms of his own morale. <clears throat> and in this particular case, losing the election meant that the black dog <coughs> got him by the throat. And um, his wife, Timmy, said, uh, well, there, there may be some benefit to what has happened. And he said, it's very well disguised. <laughs> and he was very depressed by it all. Uh, actually uh, so depressed that when the king uh, offered him the order of, uh, the order of merit, uh, he actually turned it down. And he said, your majesty, I cannot possibly accept the order of merit when the British people have just given me the order of the boot. <laughs> <laughs> and that is an indication of what he really felt, I suppose. But uh, he... He has to leave. He leaves Downing Street, of course. He leaves Chequers. And uh, he's sitting down in his country house and feeling down. And suddenly a letter is put in front of him. And it's a letter inviting him to go and give his views on the world and its future at a college which he's never actually heard of, Westminster College, Fulton, Missouri. And it's a formal kind of letter, really. And <clears throat> signed by the, the dean. <clears throat> but then, at the bottom, Harry Truman has written in his own hand, this is a fine college in my home state. <laughs> and then the magic sentence, if you come, I will introduce you. And Churchill immediately thinks this means a train journey with the new president of the United States from Washington down to Fulton. This is an opportunity I must take. And he turns to Clemmy later on that day and he said, and one thing I can tell you, the Americans will listen to me. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> and um, so it proved to be. And it's the beginning, therefore, of this first of these two speeches. To just stand back from both speeches, this is the Fulton speech, and then six months later, the Zurich speech, 
the so-called Europe Arise speech. So the Iron Curtain speech and the Europe Arise speech. And as I found very clearly when I was working with the Churchill Archives at Cambridge, uh, the two are very closely linked. And they share a, a very high degree of the same motivation. So anyway, um, he decides that he will accept this. And from the moment he accepts the invitation, which he does with alacrity, his morale improves, the black dog shifts off him, and uh, he's talking about uh, how much he's looking forward to uh, crossing the Atlantic. And he does cross it a month or so later, and um, he has a great crossing. He's not many, well, in fact, he's about the only civilian on board, apart from his own security people. There are 10,000 Canadian troops going home. And that's quite important because at the heart of the Fulton speech is going to be his awareness and extreme nervousness about the way in which the Western armies are denuding themselves in Europe by going home, whereas the Russians are not going home and have no intention of going home. And therefore, the imbalance is growing all the time. And while, of course, the atomic bomb was already there as a, as a factor, an important factor, but actually that was not going to help the situation on the ground where the Red Army was now, in effect, in occupation of all of Eastern and Central Europe and, of course, half of the city of Berlin. And so that's a very important background. So he's on that ship and he's thinking, I'm actually part of this exodus, if you like, uh, which is part of the problem. And he talks, he gets the microphone, talks to uh, uh, the crew, and he talks to all the GIs who are on the boat. And uh, he says to them, have you thought how remarkable it is, and given the size of the waves, that we cut through them and we will arrive, albeit a little late, but we will? And why is that? Uh, that is because we know where we're going, and the waves do not. <laughs> so anyway, Winston arrives, and by the time he arrives, his morale is sky high again. And he immediately gives a press conference in which he dismisses any idea that he won't uh, run for office at the next general election, and that he is going to win, and he's going to kick that socialist Attlee out of number 10 and move in. And uh, that's how it proves to be in the end. And uh, he's, very, he's very buoyant. Uh, he's actually asked in the, in the press conference, uh, is it true, Mr. Churchill, that uh, you are going to become the head of the United Nations, which, of course, was just being established? And his reply was he had great respect for the United Nations. And he knew the hopes that were invested in the United Nations. And he knew how important the idea of the United Nations had been to FDR. But did that all amount to the fact that he wanted the job? No. <laughs> so anyway, uh, we come to the first of these two remarkable speeches, the one at Fulton. It wasn't called the Iron Curtain speech. Uh, he called it in the first draft the sinews of peace speech. But he thought that was too fancy a title in the end, and he was quite happy that it became known as the Iron Curtain speech. <laughs> Incidentally, Winston Churchill did not invent the phrase the Iron Curtain. It's not very well known, but the phrase was invented by Joseph Goebbels, the Nazi propaganda chief, the Eisenhower Vorhang. And Churchill just thought it was a good phrase and a bad man and took the phrase and used it. And um, he made it famous. Whereas if anything, Goering had simply made it infamous. So Goering and, and Goebbels. So <clears throat> that's the origin of the name. When he sat really to write it, and his speech went through a great many drafts, there is one thing which is quite important in terms of the structure of the speech. He was determined that the speech would not take 
the American president by surprise. And indeed, on the train going down, uh, Winston gets up in the presidential carriage, swaying from side to side, his accuracy perhaps not helped by the amount of whiskey and soda he drank, you know. And he finally gets to the uh, sort of early fax type machine on the other side of the presidential carriage, and he feeds the sheets of the speech into this machine, and he returns to his seat and he gives the speech. He gives the speech to President Truman. So Truman had read the speech before Churchill delivered it, and um, Churchill asked him what he thought, and the only thing that Truman said was, it will create a shindig. <laughs> and he was right. <laughs> he was absolutely right. And it's also quite important because when uh, Churchill delivers the speech at Fulton, Missouri, and you've seen the pictures, the photographs, and Pathé News and all that, and Truman is sitting there on the platform, of course, and Truman is applauding the speech, but at a press conference a week after he's given the speech, Truman actually says, totally misleadingly, that he had no idea what Mr. Churchill was going to say. He not only had every idea, he knew every word that Churchill was going to utter. But the political reaction uh, was at that stage so hostile to what Churchill had said at Fulton, and particularly, of course, from the Roosevelt family, uh, who went on broadcast programs and so on to attack it, that uh, he decided that um, it was better to pretend that he hadn't known what was actually going to be said, but he did. So let's take this first speech then, the Fulton speech. It is a remarkable speech if you read it, and in my book, Two Speeches to Save the World, I have reproduced the text of both the speeches, the Zurich speech and the Fulton speech because I think it's very important to look at the actual words. And remember that when Churchill made a speech, first of all, he wrote them himself. Very unusual in terms of modern politics, but he did write the speeches himself. And he took great trouble with them. He was very careful about the words. And if you look at the original pages, which are in the Churchill archives at Cambridge University, uh, you can see how he annotates it, alters it and with meticulous care. So he's not going to say anything by accident. He's not going to say anything carelessly. And when he gets up at Fulton to make this speech, he knows exactly what he is doing. Uh, he pays tribute to the courage of the Russian people during the war. Uh, he said then, and as he said elsewhere, that it was the courage of the Russian soldiers who basically tore the guts, was his phrase, tore the guts out of the Nazi war machine. He had great respect at that level for the courage and the bravery of the Russian people. But of course, he deplored, deplored, and always had the Bolshevik system. He saw the Bolshevik system as being inherently evil, inherently aggressive, inherently dangerous to democracy and to the West. And he never hid that. And amongst the people from whom he never hid it was indeed Joe Stalin, who he made it quite clear several times what the situation was as he saw it. So the background to this first of the two speeches is, in a way, what is symbolized by the voyage out to America, that the Americans and indeed the Canadians are leaving Europe. And they are leaving Europe. And the British, of course, have gone back across the Channel, by and large. So we are denuding the West, whereas the Russians are doing the opposite. And they are adding more and more troops on the ground to reinforce their control. And to be fair, it's difficult to be fair to Stalin, but to be fair to Stalin, Stalin never made a secret of what the result would be. Uh, he said that where the Red Army has its boots on the ground, there, our system will prevail. And he meant our system politically, socially, and in every other way. So there was no mystery what was happening behind the Iron Curtain. It was all out in the open, actually. Um, but it worried Winston Churchill dreadfully. And his fear was that, as in the 1930s, 
when he is warned and sought to warn not only his own people, but also you across the Atlantic of what the consequences would be of the rise of Nazism and of Hitler and the great dangers that would ensue. Um, he's now, again, quite determined to say as clearly, as powerfully, as cogently as he can, what he believes the consequences of the Iron Curtain to be. And what is the solution that he offers? Well, it's a solution which is typical of the man. It is very trenchant. It is not passive. It is saying we have got to, first of all, have the sinews by which we can defend ourselves. And that includes the atomic weapon. Uh, but we've also got to be serious about restoring the prosperity of Europe and indeed making sure that we have troop levels and armed forces levels in Western Europe which can at least cope with any foolishness uh, on the part of the Russians and of the Soviets. And he was deadly serious about that. And he was uh, very pleased when after the war uh, the Americans decided, Truman decided, to station bombers in East Anglia which carried uh, atomic weapons. And Churchill was totally supportive of that. And his only conclusion was that we should make damn sure that the Russians know. <laughs> and uh, they did. So um, that's the background, really, to the Fulton speech. What impact does it have? Well, my goodness, um, Truman wasn't wrong on the train when he said it would cause a hell of a shindig. It certainly did. On the whole, the US media was hostile to the speech. The Roosevelt family was extremely hostile to the speech, broadcast a great deal on radio against it. And indeed, the feeling was so stirred up that when Winston Churchill left New York uh, a month or so later, there were demonstrations in the streets, um, two kinds of demonstrations. One side of the demonstrations was very pro-Winston Churchill, and the other was saying, no war for Winston, no war for Winston. And that's what the posters actually read. Churchill loved it, of course. I mean, <laughs> I mean if, if there hadn't been that sort of controversy and that sort of activity following his speech, he would have been bitterly disappointed. Well, he wasn't bitterly disappointed. He went back feeling that he'd really achieved what he needed to do. And to be fair to Truman, I'm falling over myself to be fair to all these people this morning, uh, to be fair to Truman, he writes to Churchill, and the letter is actually in the archives at Churchill College, Cambridge, in which he says, uh, I'm paraphrasing it, but I think it's basically right, with every week that passes, what you have prophesied becomes more obviously true. And the speech has the effect that Churchill hoped for. And by 47, you have the Truman Doctrine. You have the commitment to defend democracy uh, wherever it is under mortal threat. And uh, that's a fantastic achievement. But Churchill makes a second speech. And the second speech is at Zurich. And it's very important to understand, I think, the relationship between these two speeches, the Fulton speech and the Zurich speech. Now, the audiences were completely different. Uh, the occasion was an honorary degree. Winston kept on being given honorary degrees. Uh, but he always said, you know, for somebody who never went to university, it's quite extraordinary how many degrees I've accumulated. Uh, <laughs> But um, there it was. He, he got his degree from Zurich University. And um, in that speech, something very characteristic of Churchill's thinking, perception, and understanding occurs. You see, when Winston made the first speech, the one at Fulton, he spent quite a long time in America urged by the British Prime Minister, Mr. Attlee, and the Foreign Secretary, Ernie Bevin, to use all the influence that he had with senators, with Congress, with big business, with the trade unions, to explain to them that Britain was bust, 
Britain was economically exhausted. And Britain, of course, had had all these supplies and generous support during the Second World War, the second half of the war. Uh, but all of that, all that aid stopped on VE Day. And Churchill was really under instructions from Attlee and the British, then British government to use all the influence he could to try and persuade the Americans that they couldn't only and shouldn't only physically defend Britain and Western Europe, but they ought also to try and restore Western Europe and Britain and to restore the economy. Well, he didn't get anywhere during this first visit. And uh, in fact, one of his friends in Congress took him aside and said, look, Winston, you've got to understand, uh, Britain's broke. Churchill agreed with that. Uh, France is broke. Churchill agreed with that. Italy is chaotic and always will be. Churchill agreed with that. <laughs> Germany is defeated, which is just as well. He agreed with that. And uh, frankly, his friend said, it's not worth a dime. It's not worth a dime. And the American reaction at that point was, of course, we will defend Europe. And we have the monopoly, as it was then, of the atomic bomb, which made that credible and to some extent balanced the numerical overwhelming superiority of the Russians in Central Europe. But would they go any further? Would they actually get involved in trying to restore the economy or helping to restore the economy of Western Europe and of the United Kingdom? And that's why Churchill makes the Zurich speech, the second of these two speeches. Because while very few British public figures, I think, understood that the American commitment to defense would not automatically include some agreement to support the economy of the United Kingdom and of Western Europe, Churchill understood that those two things were different and that the American reaction, remember he's half American, the American reaction would be that it would be very unlikely that they would pour treasure across the Atlantic, which they would see as charity, unless they were impressed by the evidence that the Europeans themselves were doing something for themselves. And that's the point of the Zurich speech. So in the Zurich speech, Churchill is trying to produce the evidence that Europe understands this American precondition and understands that at the heart of Europe doing something politically, there has to be a reconciliation between France and Germany. And that's the key to the Zurich speech. The Zurich speech starts with Churchill making it clear that there has to be this reconciliation between France and Germany. De Gaulle is infuriated. Uh, de Gaulle writes to Churchill and says, this is one of the worst speeches you have ever made. Do you not realize what we have suffered at the hands of the Germans? Do you not understand the price we have paid for the Nazi occupation of France? How can you possibly now get up and say that you expect France to extend the hand of reconciliation and friendship to Germany? It's simply inconceivable. And Churchill's response is, well, you better start conceiving it, because <laughs> this is what America will require. This is the evidence which will make the difference. And fortunately, fortunately, uh, de Gaulle is being advised by a very small physical man, Jean Monnet, who I knew, and I considered him a personal friend. And Jean Monnet was uh, a remarkable guy. Uh, he knew the States very well. He worked in New York as a banker in the 1930s. Uh, he was tremendously important in 1939-40. And for example, the Merlin engines, which had been ordered by France, he gets unilaterally, he gets them redirected to Britain. And a lot of them go into the Spitfires. Uh, he really you know, made a big difference. Uh, lovely man, incidentally. He told me one story. I'll just pause on this for a second because I think it's so marvelous. Um, de Gaulle 
sort of spoke English. <laughs> and Churchill thought he spoke French. Uh, <laughs> and uh, poor Jean Monnet used to get the job of sitting between the two great men, you see, and making sure that they understood each other. And there was one wonderful story he told me that uh, during the Second World War, when the French, without asking Allied permission, certainly not British or American permission, had occupied an island in the, off the Canadian coast to plant the tricolour for free France. And at that time, Winston had been on a visit to Washington, and the news of this was handed to him and to Roosevelt at a dinner in the White House. And Roosevelt turns on Churchill and says, why can't you control this man? <laughs> Winston does his best to explain why. And, uh, but when he gets home, he calls to go in. And he really launches a tirade at him. He actually speaks at him, apparently, because I heard this from Monet, for 40 minutes without a stop. <laughs> de Gaulle sits there, impeccable in his uniform, KP on the table, doesn't reply at all. And at the end, he just puts his KP back on, salutes, turns on his heel and walks out. And Churchill sits there and Monet thinks, what on earth is going to happen now? And all that Churchill said is, magnificent. Ah. <laughs> magnificent. So um, Churchill had a great admiration for de Gaulle. Uh, he found him the cross of Lorraine that I have to bear and all that sort of thing. And indeed, he was many times completely impossible. But um, deep down, you know, de Gaulle was, de Gaulle knew that Britain had saved him in 1940. And deep down, he knew that Britain had saved France in 1940. And deep down, he knew that it was the alliance between France and, uh, well, France, the United States and Britain, which was the key to the restoration of, of France. So uh, that was really where he was coming from, I think. Now, this second speech then, the Zurich speech, what is the impact of it? Uh, he calls for a partnership between France and Germany, and he calls for an economic partnership between France and Germany, and he identifies this partnership as being the key to the edifice of post-war Europe and the key to credibility on the part of the Europeans with the United States. And so it proves. And uh, we have correspondence, for example, from Marshall, uh, acknowledging the importance of the Zurich speech. And it's only a matter of months, uh, in effect, the beginning of Marshall aid and the commitment by the United States, not only to the nuclear defense of Western Europe, but to the economic restoration of Europe. Not as charity, but in support of concrete actions which were being taken by France, by Germany, to reconcile the two and those steps being taken with the total support of Great Britain. So these, I've called this little book, Two Speeches to Save the World, the Fulton speech and the Zurich speech. And I do believe that these two speeches did a great deal to save the world. And if we look back now, and if you try to take these two speeches out of the record, out of the story, of 1946, what would have happened? You see, we look back on these things now and we think, well, there was something inevitable. Surely the challenge, the dangers were so clear, people would take the action that they did. But it wasn't like that. And in fact, in 1946, hardly anybody had hardly any ideas about what to do. I mean, Europe was totally devastated. Britain was, as the Americans well knew, broke. And the United States had a very strong preference to get the boys home and to get on with life uh, without having to somehow get entangled in Europe yet again. So this was not an easy sell, not an easy sell. And the purpose of Fulton, of course, was not to scare people, but to make it quite clear 
that if America didn't get involved, the risk would be run of a third world war. And with the second speech, the Zurich speech, it's to make it clear that unless America really can see the evidence that the Europeans are getting their act together and they are serious about the reconciliation between France and Germany, uh, the Americans will find it very hard to open the coffers and to give support. Well, it all worked out, as we now know, well, and martial aid started, and uh, Marshall actually attributed a great deal of influence to Churchill's speeches on all this. But the lesson for us now, I think, is nothing is inevitable. And if a vacuum exists and no hope, no ideas, no vision enters the vacuum, then terrible things do follow. That's the lesson of 1938 and 39. And it was to avoid that ever happening again that Churchill makes this great commitment. He loved the story and used it in an article that he wrote for the Daily Telegraph at this time of a Spanish prisoner. It's a kind of parable. And this prisoner has been unjustly entombed in some dungeon somewhere for 20 years. And he is emaciated and he's ill and he's sick and he thinks he's going to die. And he struggles to his feet and does what he's tried many times before to do, namely to open the door of the cell. And he hurls himself at the door, and to his utter astonishment, it opens. It opens. And Churchill spoke that as a parable, of course. If we feel we are trapped, if we feel that there's no way through, there's always got to be hope. And there's always got to be the determination to give it a try. Never give up, said Churchill. And that's what he meant. Thank you. Yes, indeed. Just wait to receive the mic. Uh, wasn't it Churchill who stated that he believed that democracy was a preferable si system of government when compared to all the others? <laughs> yes, I think the, the tonality <laughs> of that observation is sometimes misunderstood. He wasn't saying democracy is basically hopeless if everything else wasn't even worse. <laughs> what he's saying is uh, it's certainly preferable to all the alternatives. And Churchill was, uh, he was a conservative, of course, but he was also a liberal. And um, he didn't believe that democratic politics should be left unreformed. Uh, he believed in change, actually. And he was a political activist. It's important to remember that. I think there's another thing always to remember about Churchill's approach to democracy. It was never really partisan. I mean, Churchill had been a liberal and he'd been a conservative. Uh, he'd been a free trader and he'd been an imperial preference man. He'd been oh, so many contradictions, it's you know, almost impossible to list them. But his commitment is always ultimately to freedom and his belief is always that free people have the potential to enormously enhance the position of the world. And that was genuinely what he believed. So he wasn't a, a sentimental optimist, goodness me, not after what he'd been through. And one other thing I think it's worth just mentioning in terms of uh, trying to place Churchill. Have, uh, have many of you seen this film um, about Halifax and Churchill? Um, what's it called again? Darkest Hour, that's right. It's, it's rather a good film, I think, yes. And the, um, the portrayal of Halifax is actually, I believe, very accurate. Um, and it's well worth seeing. 
But if you look at that film, the two things which strike me so powerfully about it was, you remember, those of you who've seen it, that he has a very bad cabinet. And one of the reasons that the cabinet has gone so badly is Halifax. And Halifax is saying rather archly, as he could, you know, you must remember, Winston, that wars are not won by words. <laughs> very helpful. Uh, <laughs> and uh, Churchill sort of stomps out, you see, and he's really furious. And then the king comes and sees him and cheers him up. So, um, but, you know, let's always remember that Churchill uh, did look into the abyss. And it's quite clear in 1940 that there is a moment when Churchill actually says to the cabinet and to his political colleagues, if it comes to it, and it may, that we have to die in our own blood, so be it. So be it. So it's very important, and those of you who've perhaps been to the war rooms in London, uh, you know, that's not a paper mache <laughs> stage set. I mean, that is really as it was. And I don't know if those of you who've been there took in the fact that the uh, corridors that lead out of the war rooms are enfiladed. And the reason for that, of course, was that if the uh, SS or whatever had landed by parachute and had tried to get in to the war rooms, because they, they pretty well knew where they were, I think, um, there would be a defense to the last person, including Winston. And I think, I don't believe myself that he would have got out. I think he would have died with the revolver in his hand. And um, so it's, if you haven't been to see those war rooms, it's worth going to, because I think they're genuine. Yes, let's have another question. Why yes, did hello. Winston lose uh, his election? And uh, could you speak a little bit more about British politics? Thank you. <laughs> well, the two are not really related, I have to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> the reason he lost the election, there was actually no surprise. First of all, he lost it uh, on the armed forces vote. And the armed forces vote was largely a postal ballot, of course because the armed forces were everywhere at that stage. And um, I think a lot of them, deep down, felt, oh, well, you know, Winston is a war horse. And if he gets back, you know, he will enormously increase the war effort against Japan. And when he's finished with Japan, he'll probably have a go at the Soviet Union. That wasn't so unrealistic, by the way, because Churchill had drawn up a war plan <laughs> before he left Number 10 of how to deal with the Russians if there was no other way of dealing with them than hitting them on the head. And as you know, Winston's great motif on all this was, uh, if you meet a crocodile, hit it on the head. Because it's not smiling at you because it likes you. <laughs> it's smiling at you because you're breakfast. <laughs> so um, I think that was one factor. But I think the other factor, which was more important, actually, was Churchill had been totally involved in the war effort. And of course, Mr. Attlee and the Labour Party and the trade unions, Ernie Bevan, had all been part of the war cabinet of the coalition government. But they had been drawing up their plans for social reform, for the welfare state, for all those homes for heroes and all that kind of thing um, during the war. And Churchill hadn't looked at any of that, uh, and even the beverage plan on education. I mean, he simply wasn't, he wasn't not interested, but he was too busy doing other things. So when it came to the general election in 45, uh, he was completely unprepared. And he didn't know which sort of election to fight. And he made some very stupid speeches. I mean, he, uh, on the radio, he actually called uh, he compared the Labour Party, of all things, with the Gestapo. <laughs> well, that, that didn't go down very well. And uh, <laughs> so he, you know, he was out of tune and out of tone with the British electorate. So I don't personally think it was surprising that he lost. Uh, the other one thing just to mention is that when the wartime coalition started, uh, involving the Labour Party, the Liberals, and the Conservatives, the Conservative Party that 
Churchill led at that point, was a very divided party made up of very uneven quality. And the majority of them had never wanted to see Churchill as prime minister. And they didn't believe that he was a genuine conservative, and they were probably right about that, because he, he was a genuine conservative, of course, but he was also a genuine liberal. But above all, he was Churchill. <laughs> and uh, that's where he began, ended, you know, that, that was it. So it wasn't altogether surprising. I find it more surprising that he actually got back into number 10 uh, five years later. How on earth did he achieve that? But uh, he did. I think um, I know the Churchill family. I've got to know them quite well. And uh, it's, it's really interesting. I know Randolph Churchill probably best, the great grandson. And every now and then, it's quite extraordinary, you just get a flash of the same thing. It's very interesting. But let me tell you about the, the premiere of The Darkest Hour, because this was a wonderful Churchillian moment. We had the premiere in a private cinema in London. And um, most of the people in the cinema belonged to the Churchill family. There are an awful lot of people in the Churchill family. <laughs> and there we are, and I was sitting next to Randolph. And I no sooner sat down than Randolph said, um, we're going to see this film. He said, have you seen it? I said, no. And he said, I haven't seen it, no. And I'm not going to see it, and nor are you, unless we have at least two bottles of iced Paul Roger here. <laughs> <laughs> And we did, but we both enjoyed the film enormously. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, Lord Watson, uh, the Fulton speech was given on March 5th, 1946. Yeah. Three days later, on March 8th, 1946, Churchill gave a speech here in Richmond before the right. Virginia General Assembly. He had been invited by the legislatures of four states, Mississippi, South Carolina, Kentucky, and Virginia, and he gave the speech in Richmond. Uh, again, he advanced the same themes that he had in Fulton. But there is, or at least there was recently, an exhibit in the state capitol about yes. that event. It included a letter, uh, I believe, from President Truman uh, to the governor of Virginia at the time, saying he understood that um, a, a member of the General Assembly was going to propose a motion that this uh, economic aid be extended at that time. And there was conversation among uh, uh, President uh, uh, Truman and the great Senator Byrd and the members of the General Assembly saying, not yet. And I just wondered if you'd seen that exhibit. Uh, no, but I was in the Capitol yesterday, actually. And I did go into the office and uh, sat in the chair that Winston had sat in. Uh, you always know, incidentally, which chairs Winston sat in not only because people put little plaques on them, but they are of a certain size and shape. <laughs> the one that's in the office there is, is no exception. Uh, of course, he enjoyed his visit to Richmond enormously. And in my book, with, I think there's one, maybe two photographs of the visit. And uh, there was, of course, an extraordinary incident which could have been an appalling tragedy. The carriage that took both men to Colonial Williamsburg. Because of the flash photography of those days, which was very sharp, the horses reared up. And there was, for a moment, a real danger that both men might have been thrown out of the carriage. And uh, Clemmy and uh, the president's wife were both watching. And they both turned to each other and said, it'll be all right. They're both cavalrymen. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so it proved. But of course, it was pouring with rain, as you know. Um, the photographs, I was in the Capitol yesterday, and I was looking at some of those photographs. And Churchill is drenched. I mean, his raincoat is black with rain. But he had a great time. And they all went off. I'm not sure where they went off to drink afterwards, but there's a shot of them all <laughs> drinking a great deal. Uh, I must just tell you a little story, because I, th I th think you, it's in the book. But uh, uh, when he goes to Fulton, for the Fulton speech. Fulton, of course, was dry. It was a Presbyterian community. <laughs> and um, the whole thing doesn't start well, actually. Winston arrives first, and there's this lunch. And there's no alcohol. 
And uh, so Winston is really quite grumpy, and he's sitting there, and he, he's given a ham, as one tends to be, <laughs> and he munches his way through the ham. And the hostess leans across and says, Mr. Churchill, uh, are you enjoying the ham? It is really iconic. And he looks at her, and he looks around the table, and he says, Madam, ah, uh, this ham represents the Everest behind the evolution of the pig. <laughs> we, we have no record of what her reply was. <laughs> but what we do know is that after the lunch and before he makes the speech, the FBI is sent out fanned across Fulton to find booze. <laughs> and in the end, the only booze they can find belongs to a Scottish doctor who keeps it for medicinal purposes. <laughs> and two bottles of this medicinal purpose whiskey are immediately brought back by the agents. <laughs> and Truman and uh, Churchill finish them off before the meeting starts. So <laughs> they're in a much better humor by the time they go out <laughs> than they have been to this point. Fine. Anyway, thank you all very, very much. And uh, it's been a great pleasure.